you a little bit more about uh, Eddie and Marianne. Uh, I have some notes here. How many of you were at the concert last night? Mm -hmm. Oh, didn't we have a good time? <laughs> <laughs> didn't we have a good time? I'll tell you what. Uh, just a tip about that. Uh, you know, we tried, we tried Facebook streaming it. And the stream stopped, but the recording continued. So we have the whole concert recorded, and we'll put it on YouTube this week, and I'll get that link out to everybody, because we don't want to miss a minute of it. I want to listen to it all again. All right. I want to see it. The parallel journey to a divine connection. I love that uh, kind of identifier of, of what you guys are doing and have, are doing on this Peace on Earth tour. Eddie Watkins Jr., as you know, is a legendary Motown bass player, singer, and songwriter who has touched hearts and souls around the world with his inspirational music. Eddie had a spiritual awakening in 1995 and uh, led him on a new journey from Motown to new thought, praise, and worship music. Simultaneously, God was working in the life of Marianne Gabriella. Uh, she was a single mom with four adult children, nine beautiful grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren. You know? <laughs> She's a Toastmaster, an international speech contest winner, uh, she's an active volunteer at the Marion County Correctional Institute for Incarcerated Men and Women in Florida. Uh, Marianne Gabriella had a deep spiritual awakening in 2015 that led her to her passion for motivational and spiritual storytelling. So a divine connection was created between these two souls with the goal of uh, raising the vibration of the planet through music and spiritual storytelling. And her topic today, Marianne is going to share with us a message on the consequences of assumptions. And I'm really looking forward to that. Right here, right now, they are sharing their music and message with us. Again, let's welcome them. In God's timing, a man walked up to the top of the mountain to speak to God. The man asked God, what is a million years to you? And God said, one minute. Then the man asked God, well, what is a million dollars to you? And God said, a penny. Then the man asked God, can I have a penny? And God said, sure. In a minute. <laughs> it's, it's all about God's timing. Some of you who know my story know that in 2020 I had a health challenge. And by the grace of God, I stand before you today. By the grace of God, after overcoming a few obstacles, Eddie and I have met our dreams to continue on a Peace on Earth tour together. An extreme gratitude and blessing to Reverend Joanne, Joe, and this very warm community. I truly feel like there's a piece of home in this room right now. Take a breath and let it out Try to think about what would love do now Wondering if you should Cross that line for good Whatever you decide Ask yourself from inside what would love do now? What would love do now? I'm going to read a poem to you by Valerie Cox, who Wayne Dyer used in many of his podcasts. I believe it has a great message 
and please immerse yourself in these words. A woman was waiting at the airport one night with several long hours before her flight. She hunted for a book in the airport shops, bought a bag of cookies, and found a place to drop. She was engrossed in her book, but happened to see that a man was sitting beside her as bold as can be, grabbed a cookie or two from the bag in between, <laughs> which she tried to ignore to avoid a scene. So she munched the cookies and watched the clock as the gusty cookie monster thief diminished her stock. <laughs> she was getting more irritated as the minutes ticked by, thinking if I wasn't so nice, I'd blacken his eye. <laughs> With each cookie she took, he took one too. When only one was left, she wondered, what would he do? With a smile on his face and a nervous laugh, he took the last cookie and broke it in half. He offered her half as he ate the other. She snatched it from him and thought, oh brother, <laughs> this guy has some nerve and he's also rude. Why, he didn't show any gratitude. She had never known when she had been so galled and sighed when relief when her flight was called. She gathered her belongings and headed for the gate, refusing to look back at that thieving in great. <laughs> <laughs> she boarded the plane and sank in her seat. Then she sought her book, which was almost complete. She looked in her baggage and gasped with surprise. There was her bag of cookies in front of her eyes. <laughs> if mine are here, she moaned in despair, the others were his, and he tried to share. Too late to apologize, she realized with grief that she was the rude one, the ingrate. The thief. <laughs> <laughs> Good one, yeah. Wow. <laughs> Whoa. How many times in our lives have we absolutely known that something was a certain way, only to discover later that what we believed to be true was not? I know I have. The poem offers various lessons. Is this really our opinion, or did someone else teach us and we did not question it? Sometimes it's a childhood tape that we play in our, in our mind. Is this a, a, a statement of an angle or a situation that we had proof that something wasn't right? Do we make conclusions and stick to it, unwilling, to challenge our own bias. When we assume, we make judgments, or a belief without having any information. This can lead to distorted perceptions, irrational decisions, and negative outcomes. I'll just throw in here that when I first met Eddie Watkins Jr., he asked me to come over for a cup of coffee. Well, I'm Italian. I don't know what a cup of coffee is. So for three days, I shopped. And when Eddie walked in, I had a buffet. And he said, I only wanted coffee. <laughs> I surely assumed. <laughs> your assumptions are your windows of the world. Scrub them off every once in a while or the light can't come in. And then there's many misunderstandings, lack of communication. If people assume that others understand their intentions, it can lead to confusion and conflict when the assumption is incorrect. This can have a huge strain 
on relationships, personal and professional. How many of us will turn around and think or expect that our husbands, our children, uh, co-workers should know what we're feeling? They have no idea. <laughs> so, you know, be open and, and say, this is what I would like. They say no, at least they can't assume what you needed. <laughs> Assess your beliefs. Ask questions. Seek multiple perspectives. And here's a real great way of looking at life. How about choosing positive assumptions? I look at you and I think you're just beautiful and having a great day. Positive assumptions. <laughs> oh gosh. There is a quote. If you insist on continuing to make assumptions on my character, assume this, you will always be wrong. Abraham Maslow. Whether right or wrong Doesn't matter just as long As you let your heart decide Ask yourself from inside. What would love do now? I would like to share a story about a man and his family who made assumptions and how it affected his life. Here is his story. Years ago, we moved into a new neighborhood. Our son was 14 years old and fond of playing loud rap music. We had a neighbor who lived two doors down, an older woman who we would often see walking past our house. Her stride was always fast and determined. She looked straight ahead and it seemed to us that she had a perpetual angry and sour look on her face. Certainly, when she walked past our house, she never slowed down or made the slightest gesture in our direction. We quickly decided that she was probably annoyed by the loud rap music, or she didn't like us, and she certainly didn't like our son. The first time we ever spoke to her was five years later. She knocked on our door, and introduced herself. The purpose of her visit? She asked us if she could pick some wildflowers that we had growing in the front of our house. Why did she want flowers? Her son was in the late stage of cancer. He loved flowers, but only wildflowers. And that is God. We then learned more. Just about the time that we moved in, our neighbor's husband had died of cancer. These long walks that she took were her way of healing from the great loss. What we interpreted as anger was much more about loss. For five years, we made assumptions we told ourselves stories that she didn't like us, and we told ourselves and acted upon that and shut the door on the possibility of knowing our neighbor and what she was going through. The moral of the story, don't pass judgment. When in doubt about where a person is coming from, ask. Come into a situation with an open heart and a genuine desire to be informed.
story of the consequences of assumptions. After raising four children as a single mom under the most difficult circumstances, you would think that when my youngest daughter said she was getting her own apartment, I would rejoice. <laughs> I did not. <laughs> the children were my life and I wrapped my world around them. Who would I cook for? Make cookies, watch movies. I needed to be needed. And that was the only way I knew how. This may sound totally insane, because it was, <laughs> but every word I'm about to tell you is truth. I started visualizing that I would meet someone who went through a terrible divorce and had young children. <laughs> who visualizes that? <laughs> <laughs> You're looking at her. <laughs> I thought in my mind over and over again, I would give them this beautiful home filled with love and peace and joy, and we would live happily ever after. God said, ask and you shall receive. <laughs> after 18 years, I married a Jewish physician who went through a really bad divorce and had Three small children, six, nine, and ten. So what you manifest, you may get. <laughs> the blended family was one of the most difficult chapters of my life. <laughs> Let me share with you the consequences of assumption. My former husband assumed it would be just us. He forgot about the four children, nine grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren <laughs> that I had. He assumed it would be only his religion and not what I may believe. So under these assumptions, visualize the first time I'm dragging a Christmas tree into the home. <laughs> <laughs> Reality hit. <laughs> When I had my big family around the table and we're all talking at one time and it sounds really loud, but it isn't. We're talking. <laughs> he got up from the table, excused himself, and went in the study. A rude awakening for him. So I tried everything. I put a Christmas tree on one side of the house and Hanukkah on the other side. Children loved it. I started cooking Italian food and Jewish food. I figured matzo ball, meatball, what's the difference? <laughs> <laughs> when I had my little six-year-old look up at me at the stove and say to me, are you going to put garlic in the potato lockers? <laughs> I had to calm her down and tell her no. <laughs> I went to the Jewish temple. I prayed with them. I did their bat mitzvahs, their bar mitzvahs. I went to Israel. Nothing was enough. It wasn't what he expected. He assumed a different life. So therefore, he went on the internet after all the kids were in college, and he decided to shop for something different. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't... You know, I, I took care of the kids. Okay, your job's over, right? And he met a Jewish woman while I was still in the house. And he told me, sorry, I love you, but the universe is against us. And uh, <laughs> don't let the door hit you. But, uh, as I left the house that I designed with these wonderful children, I was devastated. I didn't know what to do. So at that time, I didn't know this new thought. I didn't have any of these spiritual tools. So I went to church, and I sat there, hour after hour, mass after mass, asking God, why? I thought I really had it right this time. And finally, the deacon came up and sat with me, and he says, tell me your story. What's wrong? And I told him. 
And he said, no. God placed you in that home to help those children through that very difficult divorce. And your job is over. There's something else you need to do. So I left, had to start all over again. And years have passed. It would take a very long time to tell you the in-between. Many years later, I received a call from my oldest stepdaughter. And she said, can I come over for dinner? And I said, sure. And we sat down. And I can't tell you the feeling it was for her to walk through my home that I had put together for myself. And we sat at the table, and we talked, and we shared, and we laughed, and we cried. And as she left, she hugged me and said, thank you for caring about us. Because our stepmother now doesn't even want us in the house. And I'm sorry for the way we treated you. And I healed a little bit. My stepson, Sam, is just a beautiful human being. But he did not understand how I could continue to love all of them after how they treated me. And at that time, I really wish I had the tools to tell him. Forgiveness is a beautiful, beautiful concept of freeing yourself. So now, it's a couple of years later, I'm ready to turn 65. And I'm wondering, well, what am I going to do? And the phone rings. And it's my youngest stepdaughter. And she remembered that while I lived in the house, I shared that I had this bucket list. I wanted to go to New York City, stay in a loft, go downstairs to have French pastry, walk through Central Park, listen to jazz music. And here she is on the other end and says, I have a loft <laughs> two blocks from Central Park, <laughs> and I want to give it to you for the weekend. I flew to New York. She was supposed to be going to Florida. I step out of the cab, and there she is standing at the doorway. And I said, Zoe, why are you here? And she said, my plane was delayed. I said, wow. That forced us to go have dinner together, to be able to say where we've been for the last couple of years. And then we went back to her tiny loft in her tiny little bed, and we talked and talked and talked through the night. That was God, because I healed a little bit more. And when I saw her again, she told me, I have so many memories with you, shopping in Dillard's, Nostrum's, and she was naming all these stores. <laughs> but the best, the most dearest memory I have with you is spending the night in my tiny bed in my loft, sharing stories. Mm -hmm. Well, I can only tell you, I healed a little bit more. A few weeks ago, my oldest stepdaughter sent an invitation to me. She was getting married. I could not believe it. I cried with joy and said yes. And then I sat there and thought, how will I be received at this wedding? Friends, exes, family. I said, I gotta do this. I have to do it for her. But I was scared that all those wounds that I had placed way deep down would surface. So my daughter said, I'm coming to protect you. <laughs> you need reinforcement. So we walk in together and were greeted in love. Everybody saying, hello, how are you? It was just love. We sat at the main table. Mm -hmm. My daughter said, this isn't happening. I said, I know. And then the photographer says, I need the immediate family to take photographs. So I gracefully got up, walked away. And I hear a voice, Marianne, Gabriella, where are you going? You need to be in the picture. 
We need a picture of all the mothers that raised us. And I healed a little bit more. The biological mother bent down, whispered in my ear, and said, thank you for helping raise the children. The marriage dissolved because of assumptions. I assumed he would accept my children, me, my religion. He assumed I would have no kids <laughs> and that my life would just be based on his family and everything dissolved. But there's always a silver lining to everything. And I believe in all of these precious moments that it led to the powerful reconciliation between the children, myself, and their mother. And I stand before you right now, and I tell you that I allowed spirit to flow through me as I opened up my heart to be an expression of God's unfolding love. Ask questions, talk to people, find out what's wrong, what's right. Thank you.
I think some of it is from last night because we had a hearty buffet back there last night, but probably some other things on it today as well. Raise hands. I know a lot of you contributed to that buffet. Lots and lots of great Yay. folks and in our community. So after the service, be sure to go back there and check that out. Um, I want to thank everyone both online and here for the, your tithes and donations that come in via PayPal or checks or in the baskets at the back here. We are so grateful for your ongoing support. I want to encourage you, uh, uh, well, just two, uh, two quick announcements about what's coming up. We're having a choir practice after the service next week. Those of you who like to sing, join us. It's going to be one song for the Easter service. It's going to be real easy. So, and Michael Contras is going to help us out with that practice after the service next week. So plan on being here. Uh, we're going to have short fellowship time and then come in and sing our little hearts out. So it'll be fun. <laughs> in two weeks, we're having our annual meeting after the service. So uh, well, some things coming up. You might have noticed as you came in a lovely uh, uh, product table in the back. You know, there's, uh, take some of Eddie's music home with you today. We just got his uh, late, latest CD. And these wonderful uh, handmade bracelets that uh, Marianne Gabriella makes that she calls them Circle of Life bracelets. Yeah, you have one, I have one too. <laughs> but yeah, a lot of them are, us are wearing them. They're very, very beautiful, lots of colors, and they're very specially made, very, very, um, made in a kind of a sacred way, and I just think that's wonderful. So check that out after the service. You can go back and get refreshments, come back in, um, and uh, talk to them. Uh, it's a, a, just a short time they're here, so take advantage of the opportunity. Okay, I think that's all I needed to say. We have one final song, and it's really kind of a theme song for, for it. It's kind of a new rendition of the peace song that we're all gonna do. You're all gonna join us on it. It's called Let There Be Peace on Earth, but it's Eddie Watkins Jr. version, so join us on it. <laughs> Come on up, Bam. <laughs> Where's the band? <laughs> yeah, so I guess I'll put
Marquis song. Let's do that for production. <laughs> I shall not be just like you. 